Hello, good morning again. Here we are for yet another lovely session of CENG 3306 Mechanics and Materials. In the previous video, we looked at finding um, bending stress in, um, in beams under elastic bending conditions, under the elastic bending assumption, and we also learned how to find the elastic section modulus and looking at beam tables to uh, choose sections uh, to carry required uh, bending moments. Again, assuming elastic. But what we would like to do today is to move on, what we would like to do, to, well, I already did that today, I would like to move on to, uh, what we would like to, on this lesson at least, I cannot talk, um, move beyond elastic bending into um, plastic bending. So the lesson objectives for here are first, relate the normal stress to the internal bending moment for elastic, partially plastic, or fully plastic conditions, and explain the significance of max elastic and fully plastic moment. So let's do that thing I said. Okay. So um, just as we have when we're in, when we're in some other things, uh, we are going to use a certain material assumption. We are going to use the elastic plastic assumption. And if you remember from earlier material, what this means is is that. Um, we have seen at the beginning of the course that the stress-strain relationship of material is actually quite complex, but we simplify it with the, with the following assumption. We simplify it with the following behavior assumption. Or you might call this an approximation. Inelastic bending assumption. The inelastic bending assumption. Just let me see here. The inelastic bending assumption. Testing, testing. Oh my god. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Sorry for those of you who just had to listen to that. I'm just really paranoid that something's not going to be working properly. Okay. Here we go. And moving along, inelastic bending assumption. I need to see if there are any like apps that would put something on the bottom of the screen and make clear what's uh, being recorded or not as I'm going. I need to look in for plugins for this tool I'm using, but that has nothing to do with this course. So we're going to use this inelastic uh, bending assumption, the elastic plastic assumption. So again, um, let me label this as the elastic plastic assumption. Um, inelastic bending, actually let me just fix the oh, whatever, whatever. Elastic bending, I don't like that label. Um, for, for elastic bending, we're going to use the elastic plastic assumption. And I will remind you what this is. Assumption. In elastic bending, we're going to use the elastic plastic assumption. Such high production values in this in the videos in this class. Only the highest quality for our recordings here. Okay, so we have this here, and I'm going to have a stress and strain. So strain on the uh, x-axis and stress on the y-axis, just like we're used to. Here. And then, um, again, we're assuming this kind of behavior here linear and then flat. Linear and then flat. You should remember this from torsion and from some other things, but for now this will work. For now I'll just remind you. So this occurs th uh, at the sigma yield for compression. Now sometimes they are different. Generally, often they are the same, but sometimes they are different. Sigma, so that's why I'll label them, label them separately. Sigma yield for compression, and this would be the Epsilon yield for uh, compression. Epsilon yield for compression. The epsilon yield for tension. And the epsilon yield for compression. Or sorry, the sigma yield for tension. For tension. Again, so as a reminder, what this means is we are assuming the elastic range is perfectly linear and then it just abruptly stops. Uh, there's just a sudden uh, discontinuity, and it goes from linear to flat. 
Again, this is the approximation of the much more elaborate um, curve that we saw at the beginning of the year. Materials actually behave something more like linear, and then it sort of goes parabolic-ish or more complex, something like that. Oh, that looks bad. Something more, it starts out linear-ish, then it goes up, then it kind of peaks a little bit, then comes down, then it has a very, very long horizontal curve, then it has a bit of strain hardening at the end, then it loses strength at rupture. But we're just going to say, you know what, this is too com this is too complicated. This is not useful for design. Let us instead simply treat it like this. Linear and then flat. And so what we're actually doing here is we are th now this you might you might um, be skeptical of this like hey, how can you possibly go and I mean, how can you do that? Are you trying to pull one on me? I mean, look at this. Obviously, this is not the same as this. How can this be proper engineering? Well, if you look at this, what we are doing is we are taking the, line, the, the, the maximum stress as this here. So what's really happening is this is a conservative assumption. This is actually a conservative assumption. So if we limit our, if we say that this is fully plastic and this is the absolute max uh, plastic moment you'll ever get out of it, in reality, you actually have a little bit more than that, but um, we're, just, uh, we're basically cutting it off before all the really complicated bits. So um, that's kind of neat, kind of nice. That's how we can do this. That's the, that is the reason why we can make this assumption. In engineering, when it behooves you, you can make um, assumptions to simplify the behavior of materials, but you always need to make a conservative assumption. So in other words, we are assuming that we have less strength than we actually have. Um, that's a good assumption. A poor assumption would be, just to, would be to assume that you have more strength than you have because then you're going to get in trouble very quickly. Okay, so let us discuss the um, moment stress relationship, or review the moment stress relationship. All right, moment stress relationship. Moment stress relationship. We're going to use this moment stress relationship and apply it to different conditions. The three conditions of, masks, of max elastic, partially plastic, and fully plastic. Moment stress relationship. Okay. So we know fundamentally that moment is calculated um, as a uh, moment arm times a force, or if you think in terms of integrals or shapes, the area integral of y dA, where um, d, oh, sorry, not dA, df, where df as a function of y is going to be equal to, um, df as a function of y is going to be equal to uh, sigma of y dA, sigma of y Uh, sigma, sorry, that should be as a function of y, not yield stress. Sigma as a function of y dA, like here. And f as a function of y is then equal to the area integral of sigma as a function of y dA, like this. Uh, so volume, again, we're assuming a volume stress distribution. Um, force actually becomes sort of a volume relationship. Okay, so volume of stress distribution of stress distribution. And y, again, is defined as, not equal to, not this, the three, if you haven't seen this before, I haven't explained this, uh, three bars means defined as. y is defined as the distance from neutral axis to wherever you're getting the force about, the force as a function of y. Got that? Okay. Um, so if I look at a, um, a section of a beam, the stress and the cross section, the stress and the cross section here, So this is still part of the previous section. A cut here, 
Uh, maybe I don't like that quite like maybe cut like over here. And a section of a beam from the side. We can see the stress. Let me draw the neutral axis in green here. And then this here, looking at the cross section. Uh, this would be, let me label these as the cross sectional view and the side view. Uh, say side view, cross um, sectional view, view. Okay. So again, this is going to be the neutral axis. And we just have a DA. DA is just some piece of area along um, at a certain height. And then our stress, we're assuming, is linear, um, at least for elastic. Linear, like so. Uh, and we go this way, and then this way. Okay. So, let's see. Let us look next at the max elastic state. I want to cons so we've looked at elastic bending, but what about when it's at the max elastic state? So um, here, max elastic. In other words, what it what does the beam look like when it is on at the peak moment, the moment that it uh, not the, I shouldn't say the peak moment, but the maximum uh, moment before any of any fiber of the material starts to exceed the yield stress. Well, um, we know that the maximum stress is going to occur at the outermost fiber, right? And we know that the yield strain is going to be associated with the yield stress. So if I, um, first I'm going to draw a, uh, a section with the uh, strain shown. I'm going to draw a section with the strain shown, a strain distribution shown. It's going to be like this. like this, and like this, here. And this is the yield strain. And the neutral axis I will just show as a horizontal line. And remember, the neutral axis is at the center, but only for elastic bending. So this is the neutral axis. And C is measure is the distance from the neutral axis to the outermost fiber. Okay. So here, the stress distribution on this cut then looks something like this. Um, again, this is C. And let's see. Oh, how to explain this. Um, I'm going to have a couple. Uh, I meant to make this reasonably symmetric, but I guess my drawing got a little bit off. You know, let me fix that. I can fix that. I want this to be reasonably symmetric. There, that's symmetric ish. See here? Okay. Now, um, let's do the stress distribution. And so this is going to look like this. Uh, here we're going to have the um, sigma yield, but in compression. And here we're going to have the sigma yield, but in tension. Sigma yield, but in tension. Okay. Let's see how to explain this here. So we have this stress, right? We have the this stress, um, sigma yield here. But um, from these stresses, we have a series of forces. So in other words, we have um, each da would have a little uh, multiple. You'd, to find that, if you wanted to find the stress, the force generated by this little da you would multiply by the stress at that little look at that DA's location. 
So we can think about it as um, we can think we can actually think about this as a series of forces if we wanted to, if we wanted to. So we could call, we could say like F two associated with a D two. We could think of a um, F three associated with a D three. And notice I'm drawing these arrows larger on purpose. They're going to be they would be larger further from the from the neutral axis. And F three. I'm like, Goodness, that looks bad. And sorry, F four. So these are just some examples of force. We're not actually going to use these in calculations. Um, would be D four from the neutral axis. That would be the moment arm. And then in the opposite direction, we could have something like an F one. Again, to find the force for each of these, we would just multiply the stress at that location times the um, times the uh, stress times the dA. We would transform a stress to a force by multiplying by dA. Maybe that's d1. And anyway, we could simply reduce this, we could sum this all up by saying, okay, all of these forces, the moment generated by all of these forces, has to come together to form m max elastic. It, has to, it simply has to come together to form m max elastic. And so, Again, if we remember that the neutral axis is at the centroid for elastic only, uh, centroid, and strain at C is equal to, in the max elastic case, but not for the other elastic cases, but the max elastic case, the strain at C is going to be equal to the yield strain, which is equal to E max, or simply m max uh, e m max elastic is going to be equal to sigma y um, i over c or uh, yeah c it's uh, a bad looking c or simply sigma y, sigma yield times s the max moment um, is simply equal to sigma y times s. Or we can think of this as, um, or m max e is equal to um, d1 f1 plus d2 f2 plus d3 F3. And the only reason I'm going through all this D stuff is because that will be useful later on with the individual forces and things like that. So let us consider the, um, so this is actually the summation of just many, many, many forces. So we can always, if we want to calculate the moment, we can, what I'm, the, re the whole reason I'm doing this is if we want to calculate the moment, we can think of it as the summation of um, a bunch of forces. Okay, got that? Now, um, let us consider the, uh, the partially plastic case, the partially plastic case. All right. So uh, as we saw in, in torsion, the strain is always going to be elastic, but the stress will actually cap out at a certain value. So partially plastic the strain will just keep on increasing, but the um, but the uh, stress will cap out at a certain value. All right, now, so let me draw a section. First, I'm going to draw a, um, I'm going to draw a strain distribution. Then I'm going to see the stress distribution. So we have this. Then I have my neutral axis here. Neutral axis. Here. Now, um, my like I said, my strain is still going to be uh, linear. My strain is still going to be linear. But on the outermost surface, um, I'm going to have. Well, actually, not just at the outermost surface. That's you know what I think I might make this bigger. I don't think I have quite enough room to draw here what I want to draw. Sorry about that. Um, here. Oh, well. Um, okay. 
So let me redraw this. Sorry about that. I hate redrawing things, but I want to make sure I really get what I want to have on here. Man, I'm making all sorts of crooked lines today. Oop. Oh no. Um, just a second. Oh, and my PowerPoint just crashed. Lovely. That's never happened before. That's new. Okay, well, let me uh, just boot it back up again. Sorry about this. Technical difficulties. Thankfully, I'm recording, so I didn't actually lose anything. I don't think so, anyway. Nope, I did not. Okay. So, um, let's see if it preserved a copy. Uh, ten, good, we got it. Um... Let's see, no. We actually did lose some stuff. I guess I actually did lose some stuff, but oh well, it did, this is all just for a video anyway, it doesn't really matter. Blank sheet, really. Okay, moving along. So we've seen the partially plastic condition, I guess I just won't be able to reference back. Well, that's okay, the uh, perils of doing lectures live. So um, let us look at the partially plastic condition. We have already looked at the um, fully uh, the max elastic condition. Let's look at the partially plastic condition. Partially plastic. So again, I want to draw this bigger than I was drawing previously. So I have um, a strain distribution here. So that there, now if I ever have tr uh, trouble drawing things, I can just blame it on the program. So my neutral axis, uh, assuming a symmetric section, would still be in the middle. Neutral axis, and um, I'm going to have the following uh, strain distribution. Something like this. It's still going to be linear. And then maybe like this, here, here. And then going the other way, here, here, here here, etc. So up here we'll have a strain greater than the yield strain. We're actually exceeding the yield strain, so we have a yield in the material. And back here again, in, this, time in this time in tension, we'll have a strain greater than the yield strain. But then at some point, at some height, we're going to have a um, the yield strain. So maybe a yield strain here, and maybe a yield strain here. And so what this would say is that we would have a, um, maybe I would have a Y um, elastic in compression. The Y EC, the Y elastic in compression, this represents the distance to the first fiber that has a strain uh, equal to the yield strain. Beyond that, it's going to be, be uh, greater than the yield strain, but up to there, it's going to be at the yield strain, or up to there, it's going to be below the yield strain. And then maybe this would be um, Ye tension, the distance from the neutral axis to the first fiber that is yielding in tension. And then of course we have the um, C from the neutral axis to the outermost fiber. Okay, so if we're increasing the M now, to, again to take this up to, so sorry, if we look at the, um, we have the strain, now let's look at the stress. Have the strain. Now let us look at the stress. Yeah, I'm glad I made this bigger. So let me just draw a horizontal line across, a horizontal ish line across, to show the neutral axis. And then um, here, so even though our stress can increase as far as it wants, or sorry, even though our strain can increase as far as it wants, our stress cannot. So let me draw some light green lines from the um, height of the, the yeah the height of the uh, yield strain because that's going to be critical for forming our stress distribution. I'm going to try to get that lined up ish. Okay. Now if I was doing this on graph paper, I could do it a little more accurately with the straight edge, etc. But oh well. So, what we're going to have is, we are going to have something like this. 
We are going to have, uh, obviously, compression at the top, tension at the bottom. Oh, derp. Um, more like this. This is better, this is better. And then it's just going to go uh, constant. So it linearly increases up to a certain point, up to the up to the location of the yield strain, and then it goes horizontal, or constant value, we could say. So um, it goes up, in other words, this means that we have up to the yield stress. So it, it linearly increases up to the yield stress, and then after that it's simply constant. And um, I'm going to, the reason I looked through those four forces was because I wanted to illustrate this here. So I'm going to break this into four forces now. F4, F3, F2, and F1. F1 and F4 would be the forces representing by, represented by, this hor by the constant value stress blocks. F2 and F3 would be, this, would be the, um, the equivalent forces of the triangular stress region, or the elastic stress region. So in reality, if we found the moment generated by, um, in actuality, if we found the stress by F2 and F3, this would actually be equal to the elastic stress. This is actually M elastic for this particular section. Um, well, actually, I'm sorry, not, it won't be the same as the previous elastic stress, but this just basically represents the portion of the moment that is elastic. And then all of this together, everything all put together, will generate the moment MPP, which would be the moment partially plastic. Okay? So um, we'll need to figure out, we would need to figure out the centroid. So a few notes. NA is such that the neutral axis is such that the sum of forces in compression must be equal to the sum of forces in tension. Um, we know that E max is greater than the yield strain, which we mentioned, and that C is greater than the Y elastic, the elastic um, height. So um, ME, um, the total moment, is going to be basically um, the, the total moment MPP will be MPP, MPP is equal to ME plus MP, which is the, um, the moment of the elastic portion of the stress diagram and the moment of the plastic portion of the stress diagram. So this is ME is simply sigma Y, um, IE over um, YE. The elastic, uh, the yield stress times the uh, the moment of inertia of just the elastic portion, divided by the uh, height um, to the end of the elastic portion, and the plastic moment portion is simply sigma y um, integral of y dA. Oh, looks, looks pretty bad. Oh, are we crashing again? Maybe. Sigma y. Um, times the integral of y dA. Like shown, sigma y times the integral of y dA. Or if we think of this in terms of the volume method, breaking this into volumes, finding the force volumes, etc. Or we can think of this as MPP equals D1F1 plus D2F2 plus D3F3 plus D4, uh, D4, F4, like so. Okay, finally I wish to look at the fully plastic state and see what that would look like. I want to look at the fully plastic state. The fully plastic state. So in this, we're going to have a section that has not only partially yielded, but completely yielded. So um, the fully plastic state, the strain would just be a constant value. Or actually, uh, yeah, 
So here we actually wouldn't know the strain because there'd be nothing stopping it from increasing. All, the only thing we do know about the strain is that in the fully plastic state, it's basically uh, you, the, uh, it's basically E is the yield strain at the neutral axis. So we've applied so much load to this thing that we've yielded it even at the neutral axis. We've yielded it even at the neutral axis. And then the stress distribution is going to be nice and simple. So really the, um, oh, here. Really, the, um, the elastic isn't too bad and the, uh, plas the fully plastic isn't too bad. It's really the uh, partial one that's the real pain in the butt, but oh well. So then, if I draw the stresses here, It's just going to be the yield stress throughout. We've yielded the whole thing. So this is going to be sigma yield and sigma yield. Then the forces on here. I would have, um, why did you create that arrow? Uh, sigma yield. And this would, th th this would form a force in compression, an FC. And this would form a force in tension, FT. And um, I would have a certain dt, a distance of the tension force, of the, of the equivalent tension force, and a dc, a distance of the compression force from the centroid. Or not, sorry, sorry, not from the centroid, from the neutral axis. Again, this is the neutral axis. It's not at the centroid. It doesn't have to be. All depends on your geometry. If it's a, if it's a vertically symmetric beam, yes. Otherwise, no. Um, and all of this would come together to form the fully plastic moment. And so, um, now, here, uh, note, uh, let's see here, now. Mm. Now in this case, actually, you know what, um, that's okay. Let me show you what this would look like actually if this wasn't a symmetric, a perfectly symmetric beam. So I do want to give a note on, um, I do want to give a note on non-symmetric sections and how that works with the neutral axis. So here, let's say this is a non-symmetric section. So maybe it's like this, and maybe this one's actually going all the way down here. So maybe you would actually go more like that. So the neutral axis is now well above the centroid. So I guess I shouldn't have drawn that as symmetric. Checking my notes here. And the same sigma y here. Confused yet? Sigma y. So um, the thing to note is that the neutral axis, neutral axis such that that um, the sum of forces in compression is equal to the sum of forces in tension. And again, I will give a, after this I'll give a note on neutral axis migration. The moment fully plastic is equal to dt times ft times ft plus dc times fc, like there. And neutral axis migration much like the monarch butterfly, the neutral axis migrates once per year. If we went, no, that's not right. Um, the neutral axis migration is as such. The uh, NA shifts away from furthest fiber. Uh, away from furthest fiber, uh, such that the sum of forces is remained at zero. Such that it tends to move away from the furthest fiber, such that the sum of forces is equal to zero. Um, okay, um, but if it's but you, when you do have the fully plastic condition, when you do have the fully plastic condition, however, area above 
equals area below. So the way I have it drawn here, this is not a um, this is not a symmetric section, but it shifts away from furthest fiber so that there's more air that there's uh, there's more area below it basically. But if you have a fully plastic condition, area above equals area below, or for symmetric beams, symmetric beams neutral axis does not shift. If you have a symmetric beam, the neutral axis will not shift; it'll stay at the centroid. It only shifts for non-symmetric beams. So hopefully, you should, you should pray on the exam for uh, symmetric beams. Uh, does not shift. And it, again, it migrates simply to balance the forces um, to, and to balance the stresses in areas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. OK, so uh, let's see. I think I'll work through an example next um, here. This is a nice long lecture. So this is example 28-1 in the text. Example 28-1, I believe. Right now it's not example 28-1, this is just an example 1 in this lecture. Sorry. Okay, so um, let's say I have the, a W section like this. I have a W section. Now, we'll ignore the fillets and little uh, details that make this other than pure rectangles, uh, but that's okay. If we wanted the exact properties uh, of a rolled shape, we could just look something up in the, uh, in the steel table. So we have a section like this, and let me finish drawing this. I will label the dimensions here. Okay, nice little elf foot on that thing. Okay. Now, uh, let's see here. Mm, this is, the depth is going to be 18 inches, and the width is going to be 8 inches. The width is going to be 8 inches. The flange thickness for both of these, I'll just label one of them though, is going to be 0 0.5 inches, and the web thickness is going to be 0 0.5 inches as well. Okay, so I'm going to go through a whole series of things and just calculate them in a series of steps. Okay, so I'm given this and also some material information. Uh, given here, um, I'm given this, but I'm also given the uh, I'm given the yield stress of the material, 60 ksi, good strong American steel. The yield strain is 0 0.002 uh, inches per inch, and the um, the exact moment of inertia is 384.7 inches to the fourth here. Okay, so I want to uh, I want to start by I just want to calculate a series of things. I'm just going to go through a series of steps. Um, a determine a maximum elastic moment. The maximum elastic moment. What moment can we apply to this thing before it starts to yield? Um, max elastic moment. i.e. yield moment, i.e. yield moment, so solution, so let's do that, solution, um, let's see here, let us look at this. Oh, sorry. No, uh, this is not 18 inches. Sorry about that. This is 13 inches. I was looking at my notes and I was saying that doesn't match up. It's uh, 13 inches, not eight, and not 18 inches. That'll make a bit more sense. Okay. So I'm going to have a in the fully elastic or the max elastic condition. 
I'm going to have a stress distribution. I'm going to have a stress distribution like this if I can remember how to talk. I am going to have a stress distribution like this. Thankfully, this is a nice symmetric beam, so I don't have to do anything weird. Um, like this. And here's the neutral axis. And um, here then, it's symmetric as well. And the distance to the outermost fiber is simply uh, 6.5 inches. And the yield stress here, the maximum stress in the elastic case, is 60 KSI. So it simply starts at zero at the neutral axis and linearly increases up to 60 KSI uh, compression and tension. So then, sigma max is equal to plus or minus m max um, y max over i or um, from this I can say m max elastic is equal to 60 ksi times the moment of inertia, which is 384.7 uh, inches to the fourth, all divided by um, 6.5 uh, KSI, or sorry, 6.5 inches. And this comes to then um, 3551, 3551 kip inches. 3,551 kip inches. Next. I wish to find the fully plastic moment. I wish to find the fully plastic moment. In other words, m what will be the absolute max we can ever get out of this thing? Assuming elastic plastic, using the elastic plastic material, material assumption, of course. So, in other words, what is the maximum we can ever get out of this thing? Determine um, max, uh, well, let me just say the fully plastic moment. Determine fully plastic moment. Determine the fully plastic moment. So if I draw this from the side, I will have this here. We'll see the, well, it looks like it likes to draw the spikes for some reason today. I will have this here. And like so, I'll be able to see the, um, I'll be able to see the, and actually I should probably draw this a bit bigger. We are actually going to need to consider uh, four forces here. I'm going to need to consider the uh, forces in the web and in the flanges. So how do I do this? Well, I'm going to say that there are, um, first let me draw the neutral axis. It's going to remain nice and nice at the center here. However, let me draw the strain first. This is the neutral axis. And here um, at the neutral, in the case of fully plastic, the strain is basically unbounded. So we could actually consider it infinity if we wanted to. Um, because at the, again, at the full, point of fully plastic moment, it's just going to keep yielding. It just, it's, it's just, it's basically at the point of collapse at that point. Um, assuming the fully plastic, assuming the elastic plastic material behavior. Um, let me extend this neutral axis a bit further out that line. Give myself a little more room to work, and then I'll draw the beam again. Draw the beam again here. So I, I'm looking at the, again, if you can't tell, I'm looking at the beam from the side. Um, these are the uh, flanges and flanges and the web of the beam. Now, um, I'm going to need to actually break this into four pieces in order to find the, um, in order to find the overall plastic moment. We can't just do a simple calculation. We actually have to break it into pieces uh, directly. The stress distribution is going to be like so. The stress distribution is going to be, well, thankfully it's all the yield stress. So this is, that simplifies our life a little bit. The whole section is in yielding. 
So we'll have a, a, a yield stress here, sigma yield, and a yield stress here, also sigma yield. Also sigma yield. However, um, we cannot simply replace this with just two equivalent forces. We have to say, hey, look, there are, um, I'm going to need, because they have different, because the cross section abruptly changes like this, I can't use the same equivalent force for here and here. I need to actually um, use a force error, a force error that represents the, the the stress on this area times it's uh, times the stress. The, sorry, the the force uh, here, the force error that I'll draw for this one, will represent the product of um, the stress on this element times the area of this element. Um, and it will be applied at the centroid of the element. And that's sort of what F4 is. So F4 re represents the equivalent force in the flange, the upper flange. Uh, F3 represents the uh, equivalent compression force in the web. F2 represents the equivalent tension force in the web. And F1 represents the tension force in the bottom web. And the distance to each of these well, this is just going to be the distance to the centroid of the uh, each piece. So this is going to be three inches because that's because the because um, the if you calculate this, let's see the um, if we think about this, the overall um, depth of the beam is the overall depth of the beam is um, thirteen inches, which means um, let's see here. Um, yeah, we're good here. Uh, it just comes out of the geometry. The, if the overall depth of the beam is 13 inches, each flange is half an inch, so that means the web is 12 inches tall, which means the distance from the um, center, from sorry, from the neutral axis to the end of the web is 6 inches, which means the center of the web is 3 inches. And in a similar vein, the distance to the centroid of the flange is going to be 6.25 inches. Six point to five inches. And then calculating these, F1 is simply 60 KSI times 0 0.5 inches. Uh, this is the area of the, um, the web, 0 0.5 inches times 8 inches. And this is then 240 kips. That's a lot of load. So that wet, that little plate, that that actually big plate, that web, that piece of steel is take carrying two hundred and forty thousand pounds of force when this is fully plastic. F two is sixty ksi times uh, zero point five inches times six inches, uh, which is one hundred kips. So the web is carrying one hundred kips of force, or at least that half of the web. And then by asymmetry. F3 is equal to F2, and F4 is equal to F1. Symmetry. Symmetric. And then finally, moment fully plastic is equal to, um, we simply take the, we simply um, take the moment about the neutral axis, which is just the summation of the Ds times the Fs. So 6.25 inches times 240 kips plus three inches, that's, that's, an, that's an IN, oh my gosh. Three inches times 180 kips, plus 6.25 inches times 240 kips, um, plus three inches times 180 kips. And this all comes to 4,080 kip inches. 4,080 kip inches. Next, so finally for this example, I would like to um, calculate the, um, I'm given this, so I, I'm asked to find this based on a bit of information. So for part C, C, if um, strain max, epsilon max, 
is equal to 3,250 microstrain, micro u, inches per inch. Uh, find a moment partially plastic, the partially plastic moment. Okay, so or this is um, 0 0.00325 inches per inch. Okay, so we want to find the MPP for this case. So we are beyond the, uh, basically we are beyond the uh, max elastic moment, but we're under the fully plastic moment. So we want to find the um, moment that this thing is undergoing when it is under a strain of 3,250 microstrain, or 0 0.00325 uh, strain. So in other words, if I draw the neutral axis here, and again, thankfully, the neutral axis is not migrating, I'm going to have this. Um, my strain is going to be linear as always. It is always linearly distributed. like so, and the maximum strain will occur at the outermost fiber, and the maximum strain will occur at the outermost fiber. Um, and this is going, the maximum strain is going to be 0 0.00325 uh, and 0 0.00325. Now, um, the overall uh, depth of, is the, still the same. The overall depth of the beam is 6.5 inches. And I'm going to need to do the same sort of dividing things into pieces. However, I am going to need to, um, I'm going to need to consider that the stresses are not going to be, or the, I'm going to need to consider this as a, uh, well, you'll see, sorry. I'm going to need to consider that the forces have both a rectangular and a triangular component. Now I, can, now I can sort of talk. Okay, so um, let us say that I have a certain point. There is going to be a certain distance from the centroid that has a, um, that represents the, uh, the y, the distance that the section goes, that the strain goes uh, fully, uh, that the strain will exceed the yield strain. So I'll need to actually calculate that. So, point zero zero three two five over 6.5, I'm just using similar triangles, 6.5 inches, or um, 6.5 inches, yeah, 6, through point zero zero three point five three two five inches per inch equals the yield strain, point zero zero two inches per inch over y, and from this we can get that y is equal to 4 inches. y is equal to 4 inches. And so that will be the location of the, um, that will be the uh, point where the stress shifts from uh, the linear portion to the constant value portion. So now let me draw the stress distribution. If I can manage to draw a straight line here, and then, so basically this lines up with this here, and then it would be the same over here, except let me actually draw the webs, sorry, let me draw the flanges. Here. So in this case, the um, the flanges are going to be fully plastic. Here. Oh, that's the wrong color. Like so. There, that's, yeah, 
I cannot draw lines just today to save my life. Uh oh, is this thing crashing? I hope not. Oh. I think Windows is running well in the background. I think that's the problem. Okay, so we have this kind of strain, or so this kind of stress here. So I am going to, um, basically I'm gonna do three forces and then just realize the total moment is gonna be double than that. So I'm just gonna work on the top of the beam to keep my calculation a little bit simpler here. Because then again, I can do this because it is a symmetric section, but I'm still gonna need three forces. I need one force that's going to represent the, um, F1 is going to represent the uh, flange, which is going to be fully plastic. F2 is going to represent the uh, plastic portion of the web, and F3 is going to be the equivalent force of the elastic portion of the web. And this will be associated with D3, D2, and a D1. D1, and we actually know that D1 is going to be equal to 6.25 inches. Okay, so let me find these forces. Uh, F1 is simply 60 KSI uh, times, let's say, um, 60 KSI uh, times 0 0.5, this is just the area of the flange, 0 0.5 times 0 0.8 inches, inches, and that comes to um, 240 kips. So it's the same one as before. F2, however, okay, uh, let's see, let's think about this. Um, now, we need to actually find, before we can find F2, we need to find uh, the Ds, I think, because we need to know um, how far the, well actually we are, never mind, we already have the um, height, so that's not a problem. F2 is just going to be uh, 60 KSI times 2 inches times 0 0.5 inches equals 60 kips, and this 2 inches is the portion of the web that is above Y. F3 is 60 KSI times uh, one half, one half times four inches. This is just basically um, half of the web that is uh, elastic. Four inches um, times 0 0.5 inches here. Uh, let's see, uh, and that comes to then simply 60 kips. 60 kips, half of the web that is elastic. I believe. Mm, let me think like that. Three. Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry. That's I, I lied. That half is coming from the area of a triangle. One half base times height. Sorry about that. And then, um, if I need D1, it's just 6.25 inches, the distance to the centroid of the upper flange. D2 can be found by 6 minus 4 over 2 um, plus 4 which will be five inches, that's the distance to the centroid of the elastic portion, or sorry, the centroid of the plastic portion, and D3, the distance to the centroid of the elastic portion is two-thirds, and again, triangles, triangle centroids, two-thirds times four inches equals eight-thirds inches. And then finally, I know I went through that kind of quick, but go back and review, see where we try to work this out on your own, see all this is coming from. The moment partially plastic is going to be 2 times 240 kips. I'm doubling it because, I remember, I only considered the forces in the upper half, and I just said the total moment is going to be twice that. 240 kips times 6.25 inches plus 60 kips times 5 inches plus 60 kips times uh, 3 eighths inches, or 8 thirds inches. And all of this will come to 3,920, um, 3,920 kip inches. And that's the end of that example. 
Uh, and then so if we could, if we look back through these numbers, we will see that the moment um, max elastic is going to be less than the moment um, partially plastic, which is in turn less than the moment fully plastic. So that'll be, that is obeying what we'd expect. Finally, there's one other topic I want to teach today, and that I know we're really over time, but that's okay. Um, I want to illustrate the concept or describe the concept of a shape factor. Shape factor. Okay. Just something to know. Shape factor. Uh, K. Capital K. What is this? It is the moment, it is, it is a property of a shape, and is the ratio of fully plastic moment uh, to uh, elastic moment. And it is simply K equals M fully plastic over um, M max elastic, and it's generally greater than one. I can't think of an example where it'd be less than one. Or in this previous example, for the previous example, K would be 4,080 kip inches, nope, kip inches over 3,250 kip inches, kip inches, um, which equals 1.149. In other words, what this means is the section will support 14.9% more uh, bending moment than its maximum elastic when it becomes fully plastic. And uh, you could go through a derivation of this if you'd like, or we could if we had time, but just a note, rectangular, all rectangular cross sections have a K of 1.5. And there's something really neat about this. I'll show you in a very quick example. Sections, all rectangular cross sections, k equals 1.5. So one final example. Example two. Example two here, dose. Um, I am given the following. I am given that the yield stress is 36 KSI and the yield strain is 0 0.001 inches per inch. 0 0.001 inches per inch. And I wish to determine the fully plastic moment. And I am also told the cross section is like this, four inches wide and six inches tall. Okay, so I'm gonna use the shape factor to quickly solve this. And I'm going through this a bit quickly. Um, so first we'll find the max elastic moment is simply sigma y, i over c, which is 36 ksi, times uh, the uh, moment of inertia of a rectangle, which is 112 bh cubed. Um, 112 times four inches times six inches to the third over the um, height, over the c, sorry, which is going to be three inches. And all of this comes to um, 864 kip inches. And this is going to be the moment, the moment uh, max elastic. Finally, moment fully plastic is just K times moment max elastic, which is 1.5 times 864 kip inches, which will then equal 1,296 kip inches. Like so, 1,296 kip inches. All right, that'll do it for today. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Um, yeah, we're a bit over time, but that's okay. Sometimes we're under. Uh, again, that'll do it for today. Email me if you have any questions, and that'll do it. And as always, thank you.